right, so chapter 32 is going to be talking about environmental emergencies. And this is going to discuss everything from temperature, like heat and cold related emergencies, water emergencies, envenomation, um, pressure related changes, and uh, lightning strikes. So medical emergencies can be caused by these environmental factors and there's a lot of different populations that are at a higher risk. That's our children, older people, people with chronic illness, and young adults who overexert themselves. And they are of course most at risk to these uh, temperature related changes more than anything else. Like I said, these are the things we're going to discuss in the environmental emergencies chapter, heat and cold, water, pressure, lightning, and envenomation. So physical condition, how healthy are you overall, your age, nutrition and hydration, all of these things can play a factor, particularly when we're talking about heat versus cold. Um, extremes in temperature and humidity are not needed to produce these injuries. For example, it doesn't have to be 30 degrees outside for someone to become hypothermic. It could be 50 degrees outside and uh, someone is laying on the cold ground and they don't have the proper insulation, proper clothing, proper shelter, and still become uh, hypothermic. So it's more about the exposure and the length of exposure than the extreme in the temperature per se. So cold exposure can cause injury to feet, hands, ears, nose, and the whole body. And there are five ways that the body is going to lose heat. So conduction is the transfer of energy through direct contact. So I want you to think about if you were to have a trauma patient and you expose them and you take their body, which you would assume is around 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, and put their skin directly onto a backboard that you have had in your outside compartment uh, all day in your ambulance and it's been 30 degrees outside, then that is going to be a conduction or heat transfer there. And so they're gonna lose all of their heat trying to make that surface the same temperature, okay? So that's conduction and that's why we wanna make sure that we are uh, putting blankets or sheets under and over the patient if we do have to expose them to prevent that type of situation. Uh, convection is gonna be transfer of energy through movement of a liquid or gas. Evaporation, of course, is going to be your body is sweating um, and that is being that sweat is being evaporated off of your body or if you have water on your body at all and that's being evaporated, that's how the body can cool itself. Uh, radiation is going to be the transfer of energy through thermal emission. So how do you naturally lose heat? Usually through your head and your feet and that's just um, how uh, heat usually leaves the body, so protecting those areas in whichever way you're trying to go. If you're trying to warm up, cover them. If you're trying to cool down, expose them. And then respiration is going to be through breathing because you're bringing air into the body and whether that air is cold or hot, it's going to have some type of bearance on uh, the temperature change that's happening within your body. You'll need to know those ways that heat can be transferred. You'll see several test questions that ask about those. So rate and the amount of heat loss or gain in the body can be modified in three ways, and that is through increase or decrease in heat production. So if you're trying to warm up, then get up and walk around or move your body. If you're trying to cool down, then stop moving. Uh, you can move to an area where heat loss can be increased or decreased, so moving to a warmer or cooler area. Wearing the appropriate clothing for the environment, whether that is layers if it's cold or less clothing if it's warm. And so again, you'll want to know uh, these things as well. You'll see some test questions that ask about how heat loss and gain can be modified. So hypothermia is considered when the core body temperature falls below 95 degrees and the body loses the ability to regulate its temperature and generate its own body heat. And eventually those key organs like the heart will begin to slow down and the mental status will deteriorate and it can lead to death. So the air temperature does not have to be below freezing for this to occur. Like I mentioned before, it doesn't have to be extreme in temperature. People most at risk are going to be homeless people and those whose homes lack heating, swimmers, and then our geriatric, pediatric, and chronically uh, ill individuals. 
Signs and symptoms will become more severe as the core temperature begins to fall, and so hypothermia can progress through four general stages. So like I said, the onset is around at 95 degrees Fahrenheit, and then from 95 to uh, 93 is going to be kind of mild. And so here you're going to have some shivering and foot stamping as the body is trying to warm itself up. Um, you're going to have constricted blood vessels, rapid breathing, and the patient might be withdrawn. From 92 down to 89 degrees, you might have a loss of coordination and muscle stiffness, slowing respiration, slow pulse, they might be confused or lethargic. Moving down from 88 to 80 degrees, they're probably going to be unresponsive with a very weak pulse, possibly some dysrhythmias and very slow respirations. And anything less than 80, they'll be unresponsive and most likely in cardiac arrest. So we want to assess the general temperature. We can do this by pulling back your gloves and placing the back of your own gloved hand on the patient's abdomen. And the reason for the abdomen is because that's going to give you the closest idea to the core body temperature. So as we mentioned, mild hypothermia is going to be between 95 and around 90 degrees. So this would be like those almost first two categories that we mentioned and more severe is from 90 degrees down. We never want to assume that a cold pulseless patient is dead. And we talked about this during cardiac arrest, but a patient is not dead and so they are warm and dead. So if they are hypothermic and don't have any other obvious signs of death, okay, if they have injuries incompatible with life like decapitation, then yes, it doesn't matter how cold their body is. If they they have if they are cold in a warm environment and they have dependent lividity or rigor mortis and yes they're dead uh, but if you find someone who is out in a cold environment or who has been in a cold water drowning incident we never want to just assume that that's that we want to make sure that we are actively warming them up while working the arrest um, until we get their body temperature back up to normal there are other things like local cold injuries. So most injuries from cold are confined to the exposed parts of the body. So uh, hands, feet, face, nose particularly. These are the areas that are most likely going to suffer from localized cold injury. And there are several things that we want to consider here, like the duration of exposure and also the temperature to which uh, the body part was exposed and the wind velocity, because that's going to aid in how cold is it. We've all heard that um, what's the temperature, but then what's the actual wind chill factor. So other underlying factors could be exposure to wet conditions, if it's raining, if the patient's clothing is wet, if it's snowing, those types of things, and then inadequate insulation from the cold or wind. Could be uh, restricted circulation from tight clothing or shoes or a circulatory disease, fatigue, poor nutrition, drug and alcohol abuse, um, hypothermia that they already had prior to going into the cold environment or their whole body is hypothermic and they have the cold injury, um, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, the patient's age, all of those things are going to be underlying factors that could affect this. So looking at um, frost knit and immersion foot, frost knit is where after a prolonged exposure to the cold, the skin may freeze while deeper tissues are unaffected. And usually, like I said, this affects the ears, nose, fingers, those exposed parts of the body. And it's usually not painful, so you're usually unaware that a cold injury has actually occurred. And so think about you've been out playing in the snow all day, maybe you didn't have your gloves on or your face was exposed, you probably had frost knit at some point in your life. Immersion fit occurs after a prolonged exposure to cold water and it's very common in hikers and hunters. So uh, very important that you have clean, dry socks on, probably layers of socks, um, even some other type of insulation like plastic bags around your feet inside of your shoes just to keep those feet from getting wet and cold. Frostbite is the most serious local cold injury because the tissues are actually frozen and gangrene requires the surgical removal of that dead tissue. And there are different levels um, depending on how severe it is. So the depth of the skin damage will vary. If it's just superficial, then the, only the skin is frozen and usually that's not life-threatening or a cause for concern as far as the potential for loss of the limb uh, or extremity. But with deeper frostbite, it can be a concern. And so we'll look at those a little bit more when we talk about the treatment side of things towards the end of this PowerPoint. So we want to note the weather conditions um, and we want to ensure that the scene is safe for you as well as your providers and other responders. We want to identify any safety hazards like icy roads, mud, wet grass, and use our appropriate PPE, which in this case may be additional clothing for you. And so we'll talk about some ways to protect yourself with layers as we move through, um, through this PowerPoint. 
we're going to form our general impression, performing our rapid scan, treating any life threats, if there are any, getting a mental status using the APU scale. If the patient is in cardiac arrest, we're going to begin compressions. And if they are hypothermic, then we are going to um, initiate an active warming process, trying to warm the body while we are working the arrest. We want to ensure that the patient has an adequate airway and breathing. We can consider warm humidified oxygen to help warm the patient from the inside out. It would be difficult for us to really warm uh, that oxygen in our setting, um, but you could consider the humidified oxygen just simply by putting uh, some saline into that nebulizer like we have talked about for treatment of croup and that type of thing before. AHA recommends CPR be started on a patient who has no detectable pulse or breathing. So we can go ahead and do that and we can uh, apply an AED. But like I said, we do want to go ahead and um, initiate compressions. We want to start that active warming process. Bleeding in a hypothermic patient may have slowed due to that blood vessel constriction. So they might start bleeding again if they did have any injuries once you start warming them up. So just be aware of that as well. Looking at the transport decision, uh, complications might include some type of cardiac dysrhythmias. All patients with hypothermia do require immediate transport, but just as with any cardiac arrest, we want to follow that uh, stay in play, work it where you find it type mentality. So if it's a cardiac arrest, we do want to work it there on the scene. Now, it might be beneficial to move the patient out of the cold environment and into the ambulance um, to, to work that arrest, but that's going to be the best way. If your patient is not in arrest, then we do want to be very cautious about having them walk for a, a long period of time or rough handling them, again, because that could cause that cold, slow, weak heart to begin fibrillation and cause a cardiac arrest. We want to investigate the chief complaint, get their medical history, being alert for any injury-specific signs and symptoms and any pertinent negatives. We want to find out how long the patient has been exposed to the cold environment if they're able to tell us. We're looking at the severity of the hypothermia and trying to assess the areas of the body directly affected by any cold exo exposure and try to determine the extent um, of that damage. So we want to pay special attention to skin temperature, texture, and turgor. We're also looking for any obvious injuries and we want to check that uh, temperature with a thermometer. If you have access to a rectal thermometer and you suspect hypothermia, that's going to give you the best idea for your um, core temperature. So that's the best option if you have it available. Looking at vital signs, these may be altered by the effects of the hypothermia and could be an indicator of the severity. The respirations might be slow and shallow, and a low blood pressure and slow pulse could indicate moderate to severe hypothermia. We want to evaluate for any changes in the mental status. Is it improving? Is it deteriorating? That type of thing. And then we want to reassess again, um, carefully and slowly rewarm this patient. You want to start by removing those cold and wet clothing, putting them into that warm ambulance with the heat on high, um, cover them with blankets, and then um, slowly begin to rewarm. And so we'll talk about rewarming a little bit more as we move through, but what we do want to avoid is rapid changes in temperature. So we want to try to um, make this slow and even and try to avoid any dysrhythmias whenever possible. So again, remove the patient from the cold environment, remove any wet clothing, placing dry blankets over and under the patient. If available, try to give them some warm, if not humidified oxygen. Handle them gently. Do not massage the extremities. Do not allow the patient to eat or use any type of stimulants. If it is mild hypothermia, the patient will likely be alert, shivering, and responding appropriately. We want to place them in the warm environment and remove their wet clothing. And here we can apply heat packs or hot water bottles to the groin, the axillary, and the cervical regions. And we can also encourage warm fluids by mouth in this case um, if you have any available to you. With moderate or more severe hypothermia, we should not try to actively rewarm the patient. So you can remove them from the cold environment, remove their wet clothing, put them in a warm ambulance, cover them with a blanket, but do not uh, try to rewarm them with the heat packs. Looking at emergency care of local cold injuries, you do want to uh, remove them from further exposure to the cold, handle the injured part very gently and try to protect it from further injury, remove any wet or restricting clothing, 
If transport is going to be delayed, you can consider active rewarming. So with frost snip, contact with a warm object may be all that's needed. Again, that conduction can try to help warm them up. If it's immersion foot, remove their wet shoes, boots, socks, and try to rewarm the foot. You might do this with uh, warmed fluid. So taking that sterile water or saline, and you can... Um, put a hot pack around the outside of that for a few minutes or put it up on the defrost in the uh, front of your ambulance and allow it to warm up before putting that water into a bucket and allowing it to uh, rewarm there. We want to immerse the frostbitten part in water between 102 and 104 degrees. And so um, you can use the methods that I just talked about for that. And then once it is warmed up, dress the area with dry sterile dressings. If any blisters have formed, we should not break them. But never attempt rewarming if there is any chance that the part may freeze again. So if you're walking to that area, if you don't have your ambulance right there and the patient is going to have to do some kind of walking or you're not going to be able to remove them from the cold environment, then don't rewarm until you know you're, you're in the clear there. You're at risk for hypothermia if you're working out in the cold environment yourself. Um, just search and rescue is one of those potential areas. So you might need survival training and precautionary tips. And making sure that you yourself are wearing the appropriate clothing. Again, usually thin layers is going to be your best option. Now moving on to... Um, heat exposure in a hot environment the body will try to rid itself of excess heat and we mentioned several ways that that can happen um, sweating and evaporation of that sweat dilation of the skin blood vessels removal of clothing and relocation to a cooler environment is going to be some ways that you can try to change this down and cool yourself off Hyperthermia is a core temperature considered of 101 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. Risk factors of heat illness can include high air temperature, high humidity, lack of acclimation to the heat. So you've lived up north your whole life and now you come down to the south, you have a hard time adjusting. And also vigorous exercise, particularly in a hot environment. The persons at the greatest risk for heat illness are going to be children, especially newborns and infants, geriatric patients, those with limited mobility, and patients with heart disease, COPD, diabetes, dehydration, and obesity, which we know are comorbid factors that put us at risk for a lot of things. Heat cramps are painful muscle spasms that occur after vigorous exercise. So this, uh, this does not only occur when it's hot outdoors. It can be caused by a lot of different things. The exact cause is really not well understood, but it's usually about the electrolyte imbalance that's happening inside of the body due to um, the heat and the physical exercise. It will usually occur in the leg or the abdomen. Now, heat exhaustion is the most common illness caused by heat, and again, this could be about the outside temperature, it could be related to humidity, lack of acclimation to that, um, it could be related to a lot of different things, and so the patient is going to have an increased uh, body temperature, but they are still going to be sweating at this point, and that's the main difference between heat exhaustion and heat stroke, is that with heat exhaustion, the body is still able to try to cool itself by sweating. With a heat stroke, this is the least common but most serious illness caused by heat exposure, and it occurs when the body is subjected to more heat than it can handle, and normal mechanisms are overwhelmed. So any type of heat emergency happens when the body is subjected to more heat than it can handle but when the normal mechanisms are overwhelmed that's where you start looking at heat stroke untreated heat stroke will result in death typical onset situations for heat stroke would be uh, vigorous physical activity outdoors in a closed poorly ventilated or humid space during heat waves with su without sufficient air conditioning or poor ventilation and children left unattended in a locked car on a hot day so again, the biggest issue here is that you are stopping sweating. So you have a hot, dry skin, right? Patients should be sweating. If not, that's really bad. So of course, as with cold emergencies, you want to make sure that the area is safe for you. You might want to consider calling ALS because unlike with the, um, the cold emergency here, ALS can administer fluid, which could help to cool the body down. So uh, that could be one potential area that we could explore. We want to protect ourselves from the heat and any biologic hazards. Use appropriate standard precautions, including your gloves and eye protection. You want to try to form a general impression, observing how the patient interacts with you, as well as the environment. Perform a rapid scan and avoid your tunnel vision. You want to assess the mental status using APU. Again, you could have confusion uh, or something along those lines. And so we're trying to 
uh, monitor this at that point. Looking at airway and breathing, unless the patient is unresponsive, then the airway should be patent, but nausea and vomiting are a possibility here. We want to position the patient so that they can protect their airway. If they are unresponsive, then we might need to consider inserting an airway and providing BVM ventilation to the patient. Looking at circulation, again, here are some skin conditions to be concerned about. Moist, pale, uh, cool skin, you're having excessive fluid and salt loss. Hot, dry skin is when the body is unable to regulate uh, the core temperature, and that's the worst sign. If you're still moist but hot, that's better than if you're hot and dry. We want to ask those questions about the sample history, noting any activities, conditions, medication. We're trying to determine exposure to heat and humidity and also the activities prior to onset. So we want to do that secondary assessment, examining their mental status, skin temperature, moisture, um, turgor, those types of things. We can also perform a neurologic exam to see if there's any cause for concern there. With vital signs, patients who are hyperthermic will usually be tachycardic and tachypnic as the body is trying to cool itself through respiration. Uh, the falling blood pressure can indicate that the patient might be going into shock, so we do want to treat for that as well. We want to watch the patient for deterioration. Patients with symptoms of heat stroke should be transported immediately and we want to monitor them at least every five minutes. And we want to be very careful again not to have any rapid changes in temperature so we don't want to overcool the patient. We want to do our best to get them into that cool environment, remove any excess clothing, um, that type of thing. But we do not want to um, cause any dysrhythmias or uh, potential for seizures with a rapid body change. We want to inform the staff at the receiving facility early on that the patient is experiencing a heat stroke and document the weather conditions and the activities that the patient was performing prior to the onset. As far as management of the heat emergencies, if it is a heat cramp, you do want to remove the patient from the environment, consider administering oxygen, have the patient sit or lie down. We can replace fluids by mouth, so having them drink water if possible. We want to cool the patient with a water spray or mist. Remember that evaporation can help. With a heat stroke, we want to move the patient out of the hot environment into the ambulance, have the air conditioner set at the maximum cooling, remove their clothing, oxygen if needed, and again, ventilations if needed as well. You can cover the patient with um, wet towels or sheets. This is going to be a better option than like ice packs because it's going to help with the natural process like our evaporation, conduction, that type of thing. Um, and we can aggressively fan the patient exclude other causes of altered mental status, so checking the blood glucose level and things like that that could also be underlying, and then transport to the hospital. I'm going to stop this portion of the video here, and I will pick up in part two because that took a little while.